Thanks for that. Our loving Father, we just thank you that we can come together and be found in your presence this morning. We just, um, it's honoured to be here to just to praise you and, uh, and thank you for your many blessings. And we do thank you that we're able to bring these offerings to you. And we uh, just pray that they'll be used to bring glory and honour to you. In Jesus' name.
has said that um, Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. One of the things for us in living in this world is that we often find that our lives are filled with sorrow and grief. For Solomon, even Solomon and all his wealth and all his uh, wisdom, uh, he even found that knowing too much was a cause of grief and pain for him. And in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 18 it says, For with much wisdom comes sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And that's true, you know. The more we, we, we know now more than we've ever known before because there's so much available to us. 24-hour news cycles on the TV, the internet, even there on our phone, it tells us what's happening on the other side of the world and uh, all the grief and the sorrow that's going on and that's bombarding us all the time. And to some extent, we, we carry with us all of that stuff that's going on. It, it overwhelms us, it fills us. Sometimes it's just hard to shut off from all the, uh, the sorrow that's happening all over the place. Um, you know, all the world's disasters are there at our fingertips. All this immediate knowledge can cause us sorrow sometimes. And when people become overwhelmed with what's happening in the world, I say to them, just, um, just step back from it all. You don't have to watch the news. You don't have to look at your phone. If you didn't know what was going on over in those other places on the other side of the world, you wouldn't be overwhelmed by it. Because the things are, sometimes the things around us are not as bad as when you see the world on the big picture. There are all sorts of, um, all sorts of things that cause us sorrows, aren't there? in life, as we look back through our life and the history and the things that we've been through. Have you ever had sorrow because of sickness in your body or with someone who is close to you? Have you ever had sorrow from watching someone else suffer? Have you ever had sorrow because you've seen a child struggling in some way? Have you ever experienced sorrow because of mental illness? Have you ever felt sorrow because of trauma? Have you ever done CPR on someone, not knowing whether they would take a breath again? Have you ever been in the hospital with a loved one as they pass away and seeing the emotion or feeling the emotion of seeing their lifeless body there? What about the sorrow of being ridiculed by others or mocked by people? We've all been at the wrong end of verbal abuse. It's not very nice, is it? The sorrow of a funeral when the box goes into the ground. The sorrow of a loved one who refuses to acknowledge God. The sorrow of seeing someone wither away with dementia. The sorrow of broken relationships. The list goes on and on and on. The world is full of sorrow caused by relationship breakdown, drugs, wars, unkindness, abuse and hate. But you know what? Even though Jesus himself was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, yet he chose to take our sorrows to the cross with him. He took upon himself our sorrows. He bore the weight of our sorrows so that we don't need to bear them alone. Why would he do that? Why would he add to his own suffering by bearing our sorrows? He did it because he loved each one of us. He loved each one of us so much that he was willing to, to lighten the load for us. He loved us with an indescribable love that is beyond measure. The love that Jesus had for me to suffer on the cruel tree. 
that I a ransomed soul might be, is more than tongue can tell. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Next time you feel yourself in sadness, remember that Jesus has shared the burden with you when he died on the cross. Let's just remember his death now by taking the emeralds together. Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, Jesus died on the cross for each one of us. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and yet he was willing to bear our sorrows, our pains, our suffering, and our sin in his body too. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are there, not only then on the cross, but now, to bear our burdens with us every step of the way. Thank you that you lighten the load, and thank you that you love us so much. As we take this bread this morning, may we be reminded of your love for us, and the fact that you too were a man of sorrows. Thank you for your death for us. Praise your name. Thanks for the cup, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your blood poured out for us. For the forgiveness of sins. Thank you that we are cleansed by your precious blood. And Lord, as we uh, remember in the Old Testament, the priests um, having to offer the sacrifices, being up to their arms, up to their armpits in blood, and uh, those sacrifices need to be made time and time again. But thank you, Lord Jesus, that your offering of yourself was a once and for all time, so that we might be atoned for and our sins forgiven. Thank you for your precious blood that cleanses us and makes us whiter than snow. As we take the cup now, we pray that we might be reminded of your great love for us in dying and shedding your blood. and we'll drink together.
Jesus' blood shed for us. Exodus 28, 1 to 5. Um, I'm reading out the NIV actually. The priestly garments. <coughs> Have Aaron, your brother, uh, brought, to, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons, Nadab, uh, Abihu, Eliezer, Ithamar, so that they may serve me as priests. Make sacred, uh, sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honour. Tell all the skilled men to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they may make garments for Aaron, for his consecration, so that he may serve me as a priest. Now, these are the garments that they are to make. It's a breastplate piece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to be made, uh, these garments, sorry, they are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold and blue, purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. I'm sure that Rob will finish that one out nicely. So Lisa and Luke, if I use this mic, will that be all good? So as we start off today, I want to acknowledge um, the work that Kelly does in getting the, the message onto YouTube so that it reaches a, a wider audience. We've got two YouTube channels. We've got the church one and then I've got a, another one of my own that's got all the, uh, the ones right through from Genesis uh, through Exodus. Um, We've also got a Facebook page for the church, but it has been a private Facebook page, and, and, we're, and only a limited number of people have access to that page. But we're looking at moving towards having a, a public page, so it's open to everybody, um, and people can interact through the, to the church through that page. The other thing that I would like us to have is a web page not only to give people an overview of what the church is all about, but also to have links on the web page to our Facebook and to our YouTube channels. Now you might say, why bother with all of that? Um, surely uh, if you want to hear some preaching, just come along to church and hear it. The answer is that while you and I are comfortable here, for most people, the concept of church is foreign and a culture with which they are not familiar. And Tim shared this morning how a lot of people in their 20s haven't even heard the gospel. They don't know who Jesus is. And so these days, if a person is curious about Christianity, the first place that they will search is online so that they can find out some information from a safe distance without attending an unfamiliar space in which they may feel vulnerable. The online presence, as Malice said recently, potentially gives you a worldwide audience and not just a local audience. 
So if anyone is watching us online today, we greet you and we invite you to contact myself if you have any questions about what you've heard today. Last week we looked at the topic of the altar where sacrifices are made to God for the atonement of sins. We saw the idea that sacrifice and atonement was to give us oneness with God to enable us to draw near to Him. Today, we will look at the appointment of priests who were to be the practitioners who would physically kill the animals and offer the sacrifices to God on behalf of all the people. The role of the priest involved a lot of splattering of blood around. It was a bloody job. It was not for the faint-hearted. <coughs> the priests were those who were authorised to come before God, whereas everybody else did not have access to God. Because the priests had access to God, they were seen as the spiritual ones, those who could draw near to God in a representative way on behalf of all the people. Another role of the priests, as well as offering the sacrifices, was the reading of the law. Deuteronomy 13, 9-13 says, So Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years in the year of cancelling debts during the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place he would choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that was one of, the, one of the roles of the priest too, the reading of the law and uh, so that they could hear God's word. So I guess at the outset we need to ask the question, why did God want to have priests? Why couldn't everybody approach God and not just the priests? Were priests required in the New Testament after Jesus came? And do we need priests today in the um, professional sense? I believe that the reason why God did not give everyone direct access to himself in the Old Testament is because of the problem of sin and the holiness of God. God in his holiness cannot look upon sin. The priests were the ones who made the sacrifices on behalf of the people. And they were the ones who went to God on behalf of the people. The priests were mediators between God and man. Not only were the priests in the Old Testament, not only were there priests in the Old Testament, but there was also a high priest. When it comes to the New Testament and Jesus' death on the cross, we find that Jesus is not only our high priest, but he is also the sacrifice. Jesus was the one and only, the one and only one who could be who could be a sacrifice, sufficient to atone for our sins. For of all the people who come to him by faith, Jesus is our Passover lamb. And because he is without sin, his sacrifice, as far as God is concerned, is acceptable as a once and for all time offering. Jesus is the only mediator we need to give us access to God the Father. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. If there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus, why is it that some people dare to call themselves a priest in a clerical role in a church? I'm not sure of the answer. You'll have to go and ask the priest yourself. To my way of thinking, and I'm happy for you to show me if I'm wrong, to call yourself a priest 
and to take on the role of priest, mediating between man and God, is to usurp the role of Jesus. Jesus is our priest. He is the one who intercedes on our behalf. And while none of us individually can be seen as a priest who goes to God on behalf of others, the Bible makes it quite clear that we are all priests because we have direct access to the Father because of the shed blood of Jesus. The Bible describes us as a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. We are both kings and priests. Let's find a couple of verses to confirm this, just so you know I'm not making it up. Revelation 5 verse 10, You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Note that it's not just a few priests here and there, but it's all believers who are priests. We are a royal priesthood. Even though Jesus was a high priest, he came in humility and chose to offer himself as a sacrifice. To recognise that we are all priests is to see that ours is a life, uh, ours is a life of uh, um, one just like Jesus was. We are able to go to God. This is known as the priesthood of all believers, and this is a doctrine that is held strongly by Baptists and brethren and others. When the clergy are seen as being on a different level or more elevated than the congregation, then I believe that the door can be left wide open for abuse of that position. Jesus gave quite a clear instruction in Matthew 23, verse 9. He said, And do not call anyone on earth Father, for you have one Father and he is in heaven. We might respond, well, we don't use that title. We don't call anyone in our church Father. There's no Father Brown or Father Smith or Father Fred. And so if you were to say that to me, I would say, well, that's correct. We don't call anyone Father. But I want to take that a step further and say that if you read the New Testament carefully, you'll find that no person is ever given any title. Here's a little exercise for you. As you read through the New Testament, see if you can see anyone who is given a title of any kind. You might be thinking, well, what about the Apostle Paul? We always talk about the Apostle Paul. Surely that's a title. Again, if you go back to the scriptures, you'll find that not once does it mention the Apostle Paul. Rather, it always says Paul, an apostle, or Paul, called to be an apostle. What's the difference, you might ask? Well, one uses apostle as a title, and the other one uses it as a role or a calling. Not once does the Bible use it as a title. Even our doctor friend Luke, Colossians 4 and 14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas sends greetings. Not Dr. Luke. So even the doctor doesn't get it as a title. I wonder why it is that in the church we love the use of reverend, father, archbishop, etc. Even in the less structured churches, it is very common and acceptable to use the title of pastor. We know that in the Bible there is a reference to the role of pastor, but we never see it used as a title. I wouldn't be telling you something new if I reminded you of our understanding that the church is like a body, and each part of the body has a role to play. We've all got a job. We've all got a part. We all have something to contribute to the life of the body, to body life. But for some reason we don't attach titles to everybody in the church. We don't say projectionist Luke, keyboardist Kelly, prayer warrior Anne, or deacon Mal. 
Churches do like to attach the title to pastors, though. I wonder why that might be. I have my own little theory. I think it's a ploy of the enemy to elevate the pastor above the other members of the body and to open the door for pride to come in. Do you know that the majority of disputes in church life that occur often involve the pastor? So what Satan always tries to do one way or the other is to create a division between pastors and their flock. God has made it clear that we will be united together as one body, with one head. And the pastor is not the head. There is only one authority in the church, and that authority is the head of the church, and that is Jesus. The pastor does not have authority in the church other than delegated authority that Jesus gives him from time to time. We noted before that no men in the New Testament were given a title, but that's not quite true. For one man is given a title. In fact, he is given many titles and many names. One of his many names is Jesus, and one of his many titles is Lord. He is Lord Jesus. He is also King Jesus. He is our authority. He is the one who gives directions, leads and guides. Just like Mary said to the servants at the wedding in Cana, whatever he tells you to do, do it. He is not just King and he is not just Lord, but he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But before he was exalted to that position, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He offered himself as a sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. And we are all familiar with the passage from Philippians 2 verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by become a be becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Humility is the key, and it is vital that pastors and all those who have leadership roles in the church carry out their roles with absolute commitment to servanthood, following on in the footsteps of Jesus. In Matthew 20, after Jesus predicted his own death for the third time, the mother of two of the disciples came to Jesus and asked if her sons could sit on his right hand and on the left hand when Jesus came into his kingdom. And when the other ten disciples heard about that, they were indignant with the two brothers, the fact that they wanted to elevate themselves within the kingdom and be seen as higher than the others. In response to this incident, Jesus gave them words of such wisdom that we would do well to consider them this morning. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Brothers and sisters, Jesus specifically calls us not to see ourselves as above others, but he calls us to be servants. Greatness is found through servanthood. Whoever wants to be first must become like a slave. Jesus himself came to serve and he demonstrated his servanthood by dying for all the people. He could have set himself up as a king in Galilee and had everyone bowing down to him. He could have come down off the cross and saved himself from death. He could have called 10,000 legions of angels to rescue him. But no, 
in the greatest display of humility ever, our High Priest offered himself to God on the cross as a substitute for our sins. He took our place in punishment. In his mercy, he allowed himself to be led as a lamb to the slaughter, and he did not open his mouth. Thank you, Jesus, for your humility and your servanthood. Thank you that you allowed yourself to go to the lowest place. Thank you for your supreme example. I sometimes think that when ministers get a lot of satisfaction from their title and they enjoy being looked up to, that they are not always following in Jesus' humility and servanthood. There was a pastor back in the 1800s who was a powerful man in what he was accomplishing for God. The size of the church he pastored was over 8,000 people back in the day before they had mega churches. And if you, you read of his biography, you see that the amount of work that he did and the things that he accomplished with the kingdom of God was just phenomenal. He was a workaholic for God. His name was Charles Spurgeon, and if ever anyone deserved to be looked up to as a man of God, it was him. He had a title. It was uh, Reverend Charles Spurgeon, and he was part of the Baptist system. But Charles Spurgeon was never ordained, he accepted the title of reverend early in his ministry, but as the time went on, he came to see that it was wrong and he chose not to be known by a title. He laid it aside. He, um, he, uh, he uh, yeah, what did I say? Yeah. It was because of the, the wants of others rather than his own that uh, eventually he, he uh, um, did, did in fact take on the title of pastor, but reverend he decided to lay down. And the reason that he dropped the title of Reverend was because he saw a link between such titles and pride. And Spurgeon said of himself, My pride is so infernal that there is not a man on earth who can hold it in, and all their silly attempts are futile, but then my master can do it, and he will. And just like Charles Spurgeon, each of us has a lifelong battle with pride. The suffering that we all endure is part of the refining process to rid us of pride and selfishness and to make us totally dependent on God. For myself, I pray that God will enable me to be humble and that I will accept the suffering that he bestows as a gracious gift and that in the economy of God, I'll see that it is for my greater good. So as we draw to a close this morning, the reminder is that we are all priests and that no one man is a priest who mediates on our behalf. As priests together, we recognise the holiness and the sanctity of our calling. We have access into the presence of God because of the shed blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our High Priest and he intercedes before us, intercedes for us before the throne of grace. He mentions you before no, by your name before the Father and he loves you with an everlasting love. Our role as priests is to draw near to that holy trinity in humility and to receive from them divine grace to bring to him and to bring to him the names of the dear souls that he has placed upon our heart. Our role as priests is to sacrifice our time and ourselves upon the altar as we labour in prayer, especially for those who are outside of the kingdom. May God anoint us to be priestly in all that we do and say. May we be clothed not only with priestly garments of the Old Testament, but may we be clothed with Christ, who is our righteousness. Amen. Okay. We have our closing song now. One is my Jesus, my Saviour. Thank you, Rob, for those inspiring thoughts. Thank you for pastoring us. <laughs>
much for coming. We 7 p.m. we have Craig Hawkins, the uh, creator king, and uh, he's going to bring us lots of interesting chats. There'll be supper, um, and yeah, we'll have a bit of plate to share if you can, and tell anyone, anyone yet who might not have heard of it or received a drop letter drop. Uh, we have uh, prayer Bible study, I think, continue on uh, Tuesday, 5.30, 10.30. Um, anything else? on the radar, of course, we're always here for, to uh, pray for people in the back room here, but uh, for now it's the uh, first Sunday, Communion Sunday, we have a bit of lunch out to the back, and uh, shall we sing our benediction? Or do you have one out? I've got one. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. This one comes from Colossians chapter 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen.